Welcome to the Psychology Talk podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Scott Hoy. The Psychology Talk podcast is a unique conversation about psychology from around the globe. We bring you ideas from mental health practitioners and experts to keep you informed about the latest issues and trends. Topics include developments and research in psychotherapy and social sciences, hypnosis and mind-body treatments, meditation and spirituality, and new treatment modalities. And while you're listening, please take a moment to subscribe and give us a review at your favorite streaming site. It helps us to grow and further reach people with quality programming. And now, here's the episode. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Psychology Talk podcast. Today, my guest is Dr. Michael L. Say. Michael is a clinical psychologist and a mental health educator at the Manhattan School of Music. He's also the author of the new book, Therapeutic Improvisation, How to Stop Winging It and Own It as a Therapist. Michael and I will be discussing his book, that topic, and I suspect much more. Michael, welcome to the show. Great to be with you, Scott. Absolutely. Thank you so much for taking the time out on an early Friday morning or afternoon in your in your neck of the woods there in New York. Well, um, I read your book. Uh, I, I grok your book. Uh, I get it uh, because my background was in fine art. I have a BFA in printmaking and art history, and uh, I have uh, worked as a musician off and on and as an actor. So improvisation and creativity is, I mean, my, my dissertation was on creativity and hypnosis. So this really, this book thrilled me for a number of reasons, mainly because it takes, for me, it was eye opening. I wish I'd had this book as a, as a, a burgeoning psychotherapist because it would have like helped me frame what I was doing from a really awesome meta perspective, a kind of trans theoretical model. So you, those out you there, those of you out there in the listening audience, if you adhere to one or another school of psychotherapy or a school of thought of human, human behavior and development, fear not, this book will still be for you because it, it really dives deep into the process of doing psychotherapy in a very concise way at the same time providing you with lots of tools and perspectives to increase your creativity in the consulting room. Uh, so that being said, how did you come up with this book? This is, this is brilliant stuff. How did you do it? How, where did this come from? <laughs> it's so interesting. Um, you know, I think it's, it's the same kind of thing that you said. I wish I had this book when I was starting out as well. And I think, you know, it's funny, whenever I've read therapists writing about therapy and the process, you know, even the masters, so to speak, I've always been intrigued by how they've been trying to hold together these two sides of our interesting science and art. Like, how do we listen deeply and openly and yet zero in and laser in, in a discriminating and thoughtful way? to help make something out of this steaming kind of chaos of, of emotional and intellectual life. But then how do we also create the kind of presence and emotional connection that helps facilitate in, in a catalytic way that we can make something? And then how do we do it together? It, it, it's always been something that has been intriguing to me. And, and I've always thought like there's a way in which when I watch, like I work in Manhattan school of music, as I've been working with these musicians for the past four or five years, I'm like, Oh my gosh, musicians don't see any distinction between science and art. Cause they're always talking about technique and always trying to figure out how that is in service of expressivity. I think great writers always think about how technique is in the service of the art actors. And I thought, isn't it funny that as therapists, I think we, we definitely talk about it amongst ourselves and each other, but as a field, I don't, I sometimes think we forget how much of an art form this is, but also the reason when you said, why did I try to make this trans theoretical is I wanted to show the fundamental operating system of what we do as therapists and human beings has a real kind of specific architecture has a real specific structure that Carl Rogers was trying to get at, that Sigmund Freud, that Marshall Linehan, that Stephen Hayes, that all of the Irvin Yalom, all these folks are trying to help us see that underlying scientific structure that helps us create the art. Yeah, uh, but sometimes you, you get lost from the, the, you can't separate the forest from the trees. And I think your book shows 
shows the trees or I think shows the forest. It doesn't it doesn't get down into the to the to minuscule necessarily, but it does a great job of clarifying what all those all of the above you just mentioned and others have been talking about for so long. It talks about the process of therapy rather than uh, like the nuts and bolts of a particular theory or. Uh, although it does go, you, you do take a, a great deal of time looking at uh, the neuroscience behind what you're saying and, and why, you know, uh, hypotheses for you know, good examples in, in hardcore science is why these things work. Um, but I think it's, as you were talking about that, Michael, it, it's the fact that we, you hear this off and on from experts that you are the instrument of the therapy, right? And in the process of hearing that, you also uh, kind of forget that you're that instrument. You can forget that. And I think what your book does is it it really focuses on the fact that you have to kind of tune your instrument and how to do it. Of course, uh, working from a, a musical metaphor from your background, obviously, it makes a lot of sense to for you to, to use more musical metaphors. And well, yeah. I think the book is really about how do you, doing that so maybe you can kind of like talk a little bit about how you you envision uh a, a therapist new old uh old vintage or new vintage uh how they can actually do that i think you know it's really important to like like start from the neurological foundations in a way like if you notice like children or infants right like they're they're toggling back and forth between different emotional states that are not yet kind of nest brought together and that, you know, we're built with this interesting polyphonic mind and heart that mm -hmm. we move quickly from one voice to the other. And then we integrate it to become monophonic where we are able to stay in one dominant mode. And the good thing of that is that we're able to really kind of play out from that space. The problem is that when we have conflicts or ambivalences, we get frustrated, like, why aren't I just staying in this one place? And we lose touch with being able to toggle back and forth between a mode where you notice these subtle shifts and movements between different emotional spaces. So like yesterday, I was in a session with a, a young woman and it was really interesting. We had this interesting kind of kind of reenactment of something that happened with her family where they're not as attentive, let's say, to our emotional experience. And I happened to get a text message, a very important text message. And I quickly responded and tried to get back in the conversation. And she noticed that I lost it. And instead of saying, oh my gosh, this was such a screw up, I could see instantly the emotional changes, her trying to take care of me saying, no, it looks like you have something to do. It's okay. Why don't you take care of it? to seeing the kind of slight hurt and disappointment and then the sadness and being able to represent and voice all the different kind of emotional micro changes, intellectual micro changes that were happening in the chords that were shifting between us. And then use that as an understanding of a way of this kind of recurring motif in her life and how we were kind of playing it anew together. Yeah. Okay. So tying back the themes based on, on those ego states or those, those self states. Those self states. Yeah. 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 yeah okay. So um, being able to do that as an instrument. So that's an example of how you do that. But I mean, the book, you kind of talk, you go, you, you spend a great deal of, of time talking about therapeutic presence versus authority. Yeah. And that seems, seems like it was a good example of you. Yeah. You know, what's yeah. interesting presence. What's interesting is that, you know, like, like, you know, Ian McGilchrist writes in his book, the master and his emissary that like this right brain, empathic, creative, freewheeling side of us is the master yeah. and language and logic are its emissary. And, you know, Rogers was right. That presence is all important and is the, the foundation because that's the implicit nonverbal emotionally toned connection and witnessing that makes us feel safe and secure. It's the holding environment that Winnicott talked about. It's the foundation of rapport in everybody's therapy, no matter what theoretical orientation, yeah. just as children will sense, is it there or is it not there? So will clients. And okay. presence is, in fact, you know, Rogers late in his life was going to write about the factor presence because he thought it was more all encompassing than unconditional positive regard or any of the other things. 
And so I think presence is a way of being and, and, you know, therapeutic authority is a way of doing that's grounded in a way of being. And it doesn't really matter what your theoretical orientation is because you can be an exquisite listener in presence if you're CBT or DBT or if you're psychodynamic or you're gestalt. And that allows a sense of I am witnessing and there with all of your many selves and I'm not leaving any of them behind. Right. But then the therapeutic authority is saying, hey, I want to help us work with this or that or all of them in a way that's going to create some new kind of way of expanding it or understanding it or clarifying it or making music out of it. I, I think, yeah. And the, being able to kind of, if you will, make a music, make music with the client is, is, is a pretty apt metaphor. I think, um, you know, a million things came up as you were talking about that, which is great. But I think the main, <laughs> which is great. It's, it's as, as they say, lighten things up in me. Um, <clears throat> but I think that many people don't, realize how powerful the shift is to look at ourselves and others as polyphonic or having a symphony of selves as James Fadiman has described it. Yeah. Uh, polypsychic we are not unipsychic. Um, yeah. I think we, that, that has been pointed out to me when I work with people who have dissociative identity disorder, for instance, and they can point out when my self states come and go and, and they're very acutely aware of that in other human beings, yeah. but most of us are you know, not. <laughs> maybe, well, I, I, maybe, I, I, maybe for good reason. It's, I jokingly refer to it like an automatic car transmission. Most of us don't recognize that the gears are shifting because they're automatic. And in the best of cases, they are. But often we forget that we're really built as a standard. And, and we have to learn how we shift in and out and why we can get stalled. Exactly. Yeah. Well, how did you, I mean, you know, you, where does all this come from? It's such a creatively written book and um, obviously you had your own background. Tell us a little bit about your background, how you, you got into therapy uh, yeah. as a profession in psychology and maybe how you came up with, with some of these novel concepts. Yeah, it's funny because as much as it's about the book is about music, it's really also about literature. Uh, because really, mm -hmm. I came to psychology through my mom, who was a social worker, but was a real avid appreciator of literature. And 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 I think one of the things that literature shows us, and you see it in the book, I quote Rumi and Pablo Neruda and Virginia Woolf and you know um, Walt Whitman. It, it, it is what you learn from the great literary artists is that we we wish that we were one, but we are many trying to contain and express those multitudes to borrow from Neruda and Whitman, right? Yeah. We're, we're trying to work with these different characters in ourselves. And we sometimes like to fool ourselves so that we're not as dis uh, contradictory as we actually are. And I think it's actually a really important antidote for us right now in our political landscape, because I think we tend towards polarizing and sequestering difference and even marginalizing others or parts of ourselves. And it's not easy to have three-dimensional humanity. You know, there's a kind of, you know, revolutionary democratic spirit in being able to be in touch with that. Um, but I think the, the, the reason that I was so inspired to bring this stuff together is that I always thought literature had something on us. Even Freud felt in a lot of ways and Jung particularly felt that, you know, you, I, I, one of my, my favorite classes in college was I took a literature and psychoanalysis class and, you know, reading, you know, all these great novelists alongside these psychological theorists. I'm like, man, if you really want to understand how the psyche works, follow it in fiction. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think also it's really something delightful if you kind of remember that we are just like these wonderful fictional characters Mm -hmm. And that each other, we are kind of like, even as an actor, like you said, like, it's really curious to see what are the different dimensions of a character that you're playing or that you're responding to. And also what are the different motivations and why you can have deeper empathy for it. And I think it makes it so that we can always be interested in how can we more deeply connect with ourselves and others. And I think therapy is the process of reminding us how to be more fully human in that way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, being able to accept the parts of ourselves that we have 
for some reason demoted in ourselves or uh, feel shame about or or not worthy of of expression yeah and then the funny thing is when I started the book, I was like, how do I start this book? And, and the two, the mashup that I came up with was, I, I think of, you know, when David Bowie sang in his song changes like that, it's all about turning and facing the strange. Um, at any age, we're trying to figure out what is the strange and, you know, facing those changes as a possibility for creative expansion. And yet I also think of this wonderful, warm and sensitive Fred Rogers saying that the goal his goal was essentially to help kids deal with the difficult modulations of life. Yeah. yeah. And we never stop being children, but we also have these wonderful adult expertise to help us to shepherd us along as well. And I think the funny thing is to be able to toggle back and forth between our adult and childlike nature is the thing where creativity flourishes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, Regression in the service of the ego, right? I think is uh, Gilchrist uh, yeah. came up with that. I think it was Gilchrist. Uh, basically, art is regression in the service of the ego. Creativity is regression in the service. Hypnosis is regression in the service of the ego. It's going that from that more verbal kind of uh, frontal cortex or prefrontal cortex to to the more visual emotional brain, right? The more yeah. stream of consciousness and be able to have a conversation between the two. Uh, I, you know what, I, you, you have a wonderful, uh, checklist or assessment, which I took and I was not surprised that I came out real heavily on more of the therapeutic, uh, presence versus authority side of things. But, uh, maybe you could talk about that, that checklist, which I think people out in the audience might find interesting. Yeah. Usually it turns out that when we, especially when we start out, you'll probably notice that you're either like it's like right-hand dominant or left-hand dominant. We, we tend to either be kind of leaning towards more therapeutic presence. Like I'm a really patient, empathic listener, really receptive and open to novel ideas. Or I'm one of those therapists who's like, oh, I'm excited to like give you the tools and dive into the techniques and like show you the way, so to speak. And we tend to start out with one more predominant. Sometimes people are fortunate if they have them too, but I think the work of being a therapist is, is to equalize and, and strengthen both sides so that when they come together, they create something that's greater than the sum of both parts. And that's why I think you see the greatest dynamic therapists can be as structured and explicit in terms of making points. And the greatest CBT therapists can be people who are really nonverbally and um, you know aware and, and really rapport-driven. And so I think, you know, this is the thing that unites. It's really analogous to the good musician who's a great performer, but a great listener. Some of the best okay. jazz musicians are those who are deep, deep listeners, but deep, like when it's their time to solo, man, they're going to do it. Uh -huh. and, and they're also going to take your lick and make it into something and inspire you to try it yourself. And so I think that there's something about that that's really important. And I, I never had that kind of model of looking at these different, really important super factors of what we are. Like, you know, in order to be like, there are studies on what are super shrinks. Yeah. And, yeah. And Scott Miller and the gang. Yeah. 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 And super shrinks are highly responsive. And what they do is they can use their therapeutic authority when they need it and with the right person at the right time, they can lean back into their therapeutic presence and all in the same day, they might go back between different aspects of that and titrate it specifically to the individual before them. Right. And that I think goes beyond theoretical orientation. And I think that's something that really is, is helpful in having that checklist and seeing where you are helps well, you figure out like, where's my area to work on? Where's my area? That's my strength. Yeah. Well, I think the, the, the individual in front of us should dictate the psychotherapy. You know, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm one of my heroes is Milton Erickson who uh, his, his claim to fame was one of them was saying, you know, the, you have to develop, you have to create a new psychotherapy for every client that enters your office, Yeah, which of course is a broad generalization, but he was trying to lay home the fact that back in the days when you had, maybe two or three different types of therapies out there primarily that you shouldn't, if you want to actually be successful, 
with your clients. You have to vacillate between those kind of ways of being with the patient, empathy and ways of being authoritative and, and helping them kind of get out of their stuck dominant or uh, iceberg frozen yeah. kind, of, kind of state, right? Their, their, their self state that shows up. Yeah. You know, what's also interesting, Scott, that I, I think you're, we're both kind of both intrigued by and excited about. And I think it doesn't get enough airplay in our field. Cause I once asked Irvin Yalom at a conference, I said, you know, Dr. Yalom, I really think you taught us how to embrace the questions like Rilke said, you know, and, and I think you taught us how to be artists. And he looked at me like, no, I'm not uh, me. I'm not an artist. I'm, I'm not really a painter or whatever. And I thought, isn't that interesting that even someone who is masterful at being an artist in our field doesn't really take the credit for it. And I thought, well, maybe there's something in it for us and our clients. If we did kind of approach this as both a deep science and a deep art form, because there's something really energizing and vitalizing about working on a creative pursuit together. And, and to kind of see therapy sessions as mashup collaborations or, you know, working on different tunes or working on different scenes, like as in, in drama and, and yeah. allowing ourselves to kind of really see where we can take the range of ourselves in that. I think it's a wonderful protection against burnout, especially right now during this time when we're, all of us are stretched super thin because of this pandemic and the demand. Exactly. Yeah. Also, I just think it's an identity thing that is really important for us as a field that we have under acknowledged. And you know, what's interesting to me is that a lot of the influencer writers, some of whom aren't even psychologists like Susan Cain or Daniel Pink, they're getting into saying, wait a minute, there's more about these kind of negative emotions or there's more about some of these artistic ways of understanding how we work that we need to incorporate broadly in culture. And I think it's, it's about time that psychotherapy kind of really sees their fullest value yeah. in being part of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, I was just listening to Daniel Pink on a podcast the other day, talk about a book on regrets, which yeah. aren't such regrets. Hey, I've had a few, um, yeah. you know, like, it's like, you know, it's, there's nothing really bad about having regrets or having negative emotions. It's just being uh, afraid of them. Uh, it's almost like, you know, uh, you want to, you want to have the consulting room as much as possible, depending on where you meet your client, what headspace they're in when they come in and, and what they've established is uh, which self state is going to come out and play with you. But you kind of want to think about like how to embrace playfulness and creativity uh, of looking at things, you know, looking at their narratives, you know, and, looking at um, the vacillations, as you pointed out, like with that uh, client the other day, when you had, took a text and you yeah. can see the nuances, you know, maybe going back to shame or disappointment at some point and being able to point that out and, and, and sit with it. Yeah. And it's interesting because we, we, you know, clients most want to not share those sides and yet, right. on some not so secret way, they are also really hoping and wishing that we'll make it safer and more hospitable for them to be able to talk about the stuff that they're not supposed to talk about or not even supposed to think or feel. And so I think engaging that kind of playful aspect, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's where the creativity comes in really. And that's why I spend a whole chapter, I think, in the book talking about the, the use of metaphor and humor and clinical intuition to help us soften the, the, the edges of that stuff, um, but also to make it something where we're really modeling for them. You know, Salman Rushdie, the great novelist, once said like something about creativity that's really on the boundary between like danger and familiarity but it's somewhere in between. And I think it's kind of showing them that like, don't worry, I got you. Even if we're in this creative space that feels like it's a little close to the edge, mm -hmm. I got you on the side of safety. And I also got you on the side of intrigue here. Yeah. Curiosity. Yeah. Yeah. Intrigue and curiosity. Yeah. So, well, uh, maybe you could talk about some ways that people can, 
evoke more presence or evoke more authority in their therapeutic encounters. Maybe you can talk about that. Give, give that some some space to look at. Yeah, you know, the funny thing about presence is that we all, especially as Americans, could use uh, a reminder of it because presence is basically allowing ourselves to steep in things a bit more. It's like steeping your tea a bit more. Like Brits probably complain that Americans don't steep their tea enough, right? We also don't steep in being enough and trusting that something is going to come out by trusting staying with that aspect. Mm -hmm. It might seem slower and subtler, but it's extraordinarily powerful. So we can be quick to shift gear or try to fill up the space with something. And, and it's also an interesting presence is also a great kind of space of reverie as well that I think it's not just around our being, it's also allowing yourself to temporarily wander there's a wonderful psychologist at Harvard. Uh, she studies mindful creativity. Her name is Ellen Langer. And she talks about the difference between distraction and being otherwise attracted. And I think presence allows us to be otherwise attracted and notice things that are seemingly peripheral that are really central. And that's, I think, that kind of right-brained oriented um, kind of creative freewheeling side in my, in the book, I even talk about once I trusted that side and all of a sudden I use this metaphor where the client and said, you know, somehow I always feel like you're trying to sell me something that I didn't know I wanted to buy. And he was like, so thankful that I said that to him because he said, you know, you've picked up on something that most people don't confront me on. Mm -hmm. And he said, I was taught to basically kill people with kindness <laughs> and then I started to free associate and I said, you also remind me of this character from a movie. I don't know why I can't get it out of my mind. And I shared this, it was from a Wes Anderson film. It was, it was Rushmore. And I said, you know, you remind me of this very smart, intriguing character. And he's like, oh my God, he was my hero growing up. So by trusting in a sort of presence that allows you to both be present with the fullness of their being, but also the fullness of your own reverie, which actually sometimes is, is much more efficacious than anything else. And then, of course, when you're talking about therapeutic authority, I think, you know, people who, let's say, they're well, sometimes us therapists, let's, let's use me, me and you, Scott, we both lean towards therapeutic presence more, right? We started out that way. And what were the reasons that I was worried about therapeutic authority? And maybe you were as well. Is that I don't want to step on anybody's story. I don't want to step on their toes. I don't want to overly dictate and maybe limit the field of vision for them mm -hmm. or what's really right. I also don't want to reenact some trauma of somebody not respecting their autonomy or their own inner wisdom. Right. Right. Yeah. When I think of authority, a therapeutic authority, I think about it as discriminating, not discriminatory. Discriminating is I want to try to see if this, I can set this off in a way that gives it some sharpness and clarity for us to consider together. And you're the expert, we'll consider it, but I'm going to be the expert in pulling it together for you. Right. And then the client then reaches back with their own authority and sometimes tightening it up, shifting to another way of looking at it. And so it sort of teaches them to carry on their own authority. And right. so to me, that kind of therapeutic authority, it's not authoritarian, it's authoritative, but it's also a sharing authoritativeness. Mm -hmm. And so I think what it does, and I think we've seen the back and forth between like sometimes directive therapies and non-directive therapies go in a way that either gets maybe sometimes too heavy handed with being too explicit or too directive or too passive and too non-directive. And I think the thing about therapeutic authority is being able to sharply delineate patterns or things, interventions that could be particularly useful or helpful. And that's the left brain logic sense of I'm zeroing in and I'm using my expert's mind to say, I think this might be interesting and useful. Right. Yeah. And maybe even prefacing things that way. Yeah. yeah. I'm just, this, this, this came to mind, this, this stuff from the literature, this, this stuff from the, from science. <laughs> yeah. And you know what I, you know how I hedge it? Scott, I usually say, 
I, I, you know, I, I always preface with people because I'm like, I talk with enthusiasm, but I always want you to know that I'm going to say things that sometimes are going to be really on target and sometimes they're going to be off and sometimes they're going to be somewhere in between. I always want to throw it out there so that we together can get more discriminating and sharp and understanding your full experience. Right. Yep. So in other words, it's in service of you. And the other thing is that I tend sometimes do it in terms of, Hey, these are things that we all tend to struggle with. Just like a musician. Like I had a Juilliard trained piano teacher growing up and he treated me as a high school student, the same way he teach some treat somebody who is 40 or 30. He mm -hmm. treated the five-year-olds the same way. He treated them with a sense of respect, but when he was teaching it with authority, he was saying, this is something that even I, a Juilliard trained musician struggle with, but these are ways of understanding how to work with it. And we're going to tailor that to what works right for you. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. So tailoring, basically tailoring uh, the interventions, tailoring the uh, connection. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's almost, a, it's actually a three-step dance, Scott. Because in a way, the right brain therapeutic presence is something that really kind of starts it out. That's what people feel. But then mm -hmm. we move towards the therapeutic authority of discriminating. And then we come back and check it. How did that roll? And that's how we also make sure that we temper things and tame things and, and keep on going back and forth between those things. Right. Well, you know, going back to the, the, the story you talked about, the, the salesman metaphor and the yeah. Rushmore metaphor, this, this kind of like... It points out I and others in the consulting room have come up with, have had these kind of intuitive, <clears throat> excuse me, these intuitive, <clears throat> these intuitive insights that you wanted to share, right? Exactly. Intuitive insights. I was trying to get the frog out of my throat uh, to talk about um, these intuitive insights, but those are so akin to like what happens uh, with examples of synchronicity. You kind of make a, yeah. a kind of magical meaningful moment to that person in the consulting room. So there's not just, there's, there's extra presence. There's something else that happens and I think lights people up when they have those kind of experiences, when, when they see that you're that attuned to them, that you can kind yeah. of almost pick it up like a, a radio antenna, right? Yeah. Right. That's, that's where the, that's, I, I call it the therapeutic muse comes through that, that channel, that register, yeah. you know? Yeah, Absolutely. Um, I don't know. We talked about so much, uh, excitedly because this is also cool. What, what else? Like uh, you're out there talking to people about this book. I know you, you've gotten some, some really good, uh, uh, quotes, uh, pre-publishing, pre-publishing quotes from pe wonderful people. Yeah, like I, was, I was really, yeah. I was really, uh, fortunate, you know, it was a really a full circle moment for me when Nancy McWilliams, uh, agreed oh. to, to read the book because, you know, hers were the books that I was reading when I was a young therapist trying to figure out where is my voice and how do I find it? And I remember marveling at how she took such complicated material and made it so clear and accessible and practical. And yet it seemed like it was her own. And I always really respected and admired that. And the fact that she felt that she wished that she had my book when she was young, just like blew me over. And, and then of course, you know, like when you get somebody like Lori Gottlieb, who has written a brilliant book really for a general audience on how therapy works. And I, th I threw it on a lark to her, said, Hey, would you be willing to check out the book and endorse it? And she looked, she was like, yeah. And I was like, oh my gosh. So it was, it was really exciting. And, and the other point that I wanted to make back, you know, what we're talking about with that therapeutic muse is I think, you know, how we talk about we're scientists, practitioners, right? And the therapeutic authority is that deep engineer side of us that really understands the structure and architecture of the psyche, how it works, but also how it works in real time in a dynamic as like a dynamic physics system almost. And I think the best, most effective therapists have a really sophisticated high level understanding of that structural scientific moving parts physics way in which the psyche works but also a really generously warm, artistic, creative, you know, inspired kind of way of being open to novelty and creative yeah. possibility. Yeah. And I think which, that transcends orientation. Well, which is funny. I, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of Nancy McMillian's, McWilliams books, Irvin Yalom's works. Uh, and it was surprising that the Yalom 
you know, said to you that he didn't think he was an artist? Because I mean, re- some of just his books alone. I mean, how how readable of a textbook do you find out there in grad school besides uh, group therapy, right? Yeah. <laughs> the practice yeah. of group therapy, or he's actually written novels. Written right? novels. I mean, he's, yeah, he's written yeah. novels, and his case studies could could be not could be short stories. And you know what it. Scott, it blew me over so that I was like, Houston, we have a problem. If our field <laughs> does not see this connection and yeah. we still struggle with this connection with someone who's so clearly an artist. And that's why it was, that was actually some of the impetus to write the book is like, no, 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 no. This is a beautiful art. This is a rewarding yeah. art. It's also the art of teaching people how to live creatively. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, that is true. I, I, I'm all for people going to therapy, but I'm, equally enthusiastic about people doing something creative, whatever that big C or little C creativity is that they do in their life. If, yeah. they're really, if they're really awesome with spreadsheets and they get into it and they get into a flow state, great. If they're great at improvising jazz, that's great. You know, you know, this is so funny that you mentioned that, Scott, because that was another inspiration for the book too, because I'm working with these high-level artists, right? These musicians. Right. And I can't tell you, 90% of them don't think they have personal creativity. They just think it's, I'm an artist as a musician, but not in this other way. I think, you know, reaching back into the, into the memory palace uh, when I was doing music, I had some friends who were in uh, uh, grad school, undergrad and grad school for, for music. One of the things that was pointed out to me from, from my interacting with a lot of different musicians who were trained uh, within the academy is that great composers, we have the shell of what they were suggesting people play we don't have the actual you know what they would do which was here's the shell here's the skeleton now put some meat on these bones right like so they would improvise it was assumed you were going to be if you could play yeah a beethoven uh uh, piano piece you you also were going to improvise that you would improvise yeah exactly yeah here's a suggestion now go for it which is jazz right it's the same concept in jazz right which i think that people forget that and because you know they're they're unfortunately a lot of people are being trained to just play old gray haired European, you know, yeah, and, classics. And, and why do people get nervous when they walk into a meeting with new people or a cocktail party is because under, underneath it all, we realize we're going to have to figure out how to improvise with these people. And we don't know what chord changes we're playing. Exactly. Yeah, we, exactly. We, and, and that's why it's helpful to know how to play over different chord changes psychologically. And therapy yeah. helps yeah. us understand which are the easy ones for us to play, which are the difficult ones and which are the ones we avoid like the plague. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know about you. you, you you're you not in private practice, right? So you I am in private practice as well. Okay. Yeah. So like when, when I do a consultation with someone, I like to do it on the phone. You know, maybe I'll switch to Zoom at some point, but I like to know that I can I can talk to a person and they feel they can play with me and, and I can improvise with them, yep. you know, so to speak. Yeah, I, I think it's super important to have that human connection, not just a text or an email. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, what's next on your agenda? I mean, what this is you must be you must be on a press junket uh, <laughs> of sorts. Yeah, you know, I'm I'm excited to to spread the word, especially to therapists who are starting out. You know, grad students who want to put things together, early career therapists who have always felt there's there's this more, and even people who've been doing this for years who are like, yeah, I've always felt therapy was this special art form in addition to a science, and I kind of want to read about how that puts it together. I mean, there's a there's a a little bit of a background hope that maybe I can write some like general audience book to bring this more into the. Well, the, you, you could, you could just say authority versus presence. And you're talking yeah. about a good conversation. What do you know? Yeah. What do they know? How do you, how do you like use the metaphor of that? You know, somebody set the groundwork for a con- How do you step into a conversation and improvise there and be part blend with those themes? I, you know, that's, that's why I think one of the beauties of therapy for all of us is I think we're, we're teaching people about this condition of being human and how wonderful it is, how heartbreakingly beautiful it can be, how challenging and, and frustrating and amazing it can be all in one day, uh, all in one week, all in one year. And, and yet I think the ingenuity and the resourcefulness of this instrument that we're playing with is, is magnificent. 
Yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, recognizing how complex and, and intricate and beautiful our stories can be and how there can be a sort of poetry that comes out of them, especially in these moments, not only in therapy, but like you said, in relationship, because the great paradox of being human is that we only become fully ourselves through relationship. Like exactly. that's, that's yeah. the art, but that's the rub, you know, but, but that's the, the brilliant thing. And I think learning how to kind of develop that kind of interdependence where, you can feel like you can play your own instrument, but you're intrigued by how you can collaborate with others. Like that's the thing. Exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, one of the things that, that I wanted to point out is you use a lot of uh, examples from literature and, and music and, and, and film and whatnot. Um, TED talks. They're all like, you have a ton of, ton of examples TED of TED talks. Talks. You're, yeah. you're a TED talk junkie. Okay. You're confessed. I, I, yep. I to confess. I, I, I like those. Those are wonderful. Uh, ways to gather information and you really get to the heart of things because you uh, you actually get the feel for the person giving the talk right you don't just it's almost like you're in conversation with them I wanted the book to read like an extended series of te- series of TED talks in a way well have the folks from TED talk to you about being a talker <laughs> well I, I yeah I would love to do another TED talk on this topic and and God willing, it will will happen. Um, I I think uh, the reason why I love TED so much is because it does precisely what we're talking about in terms of authority and presence. TED Talks are nothing more than poetry masquerading as a conversation. Yeah. And so they are concise bits, but they're done with such openness and spontaneity that they're not like a boring kind of, I'm going to talk at you presentation They're an invitation into a conversation and a process of discovery. Whereas they say in the TED world that the the hero of a TED talk is the audience. And so there's something really creatively collaborative about that. And what I love about TED also is that they're so uh, appreciative of interdisciplinary cross-pollination. And I felt like that is the ethos of what I wanted the book to be, but also what I think what great therapy is. It is being open and excited and embracing of this diversity and this cross pollination and this cross kind of collaboration that can create so much more powerful possibilities, even in a short thing. Absolutely. I think, I think yeah. Ted is the, the, the poetry of, of this particular generation. It can be. Yeah. I, I think that's a good way of looking at it. Yeah. Um, uh, I also think it's, cross-generational i think yeah. that, that many people how could you not like a good good presentation like those um uh, yeah so the ted talks there are, there's there's a ton of them in there you, you give a lot of resources at the back of the book which are great um and yeah, uh and, <laughs> and, and, and they and i know that there's a lot of work that goes into doing a ted talk i think they they for those who need it they they, they give a lot of coaching right yeah. uh and so it is an actual kind of art form to know you know to kind of hit a crescendo or a fermato or like a pause right yeah you know, i you know I, I did a ted talk on introverts and and that was what inspired me to see how and doing a ted talk but also being part of a community of helping others prep ted talks it was like this is this is a really powerful process and and it's very similar to what we do in therapy as well yeah absolutely and you mentioned introverts um i i confess i'm one of those or maybe more of an ambivert although yes i'm an ambivert as well yep yeah but i think that the funny thing is that although it's dichotomous i don't think that jung wanted it to be a dichotomous idea my understanding is that introvert didn't mean you you couldn't converse he was an extreme introvert but he was like you know he was known to like hold court at at psychoanalytic con you know con- conferences and you could he was a big tall six foot you know air, <laughs> biking looking guy in the back yeah. of the room laughing and yucking it up you could hear him from across the hall uh, i think it's people don't get the idea that that like i can go to i can go to a party as an introvert can and be social but my my glass gets filled up i, I have yeah. enough my battery's full i'm done yeah. You know, whereas extroverts, they have kind of an empty glass kind of approach to yeah, socializing. I think, you know, ambivert was a, co- a t- term coined by a, an Oregon psychologist named Edmund Conklin, I believe. Yeah. And he, 
it really didn't pick up and it became what one author called it personality non grata because (laughs) it was not as dramatic. And, you know, with the extrovert ideal and fuller sway in the 20th century, it's like, yeah, you're either extrovert. Good for you. You're either introvert. uh, That's too bad. Maybe you can learn how to be an extrovert, you know, like, and, and, and this, this mixture, and that's, I think the other thing that's really interesting about this mixture, I think a lot of therapists have introverted extrovert tendencies because that's exactly what we do, right? We bring exactly. the best of both worlds, the inner world in a social transaction together in ways that are really, really catalytic. And, and you're right. It, it, people, I just actually did a talk for simple practice, a CE course on working with introverts in clinical practice, because I feel like as therapists, we don't think enough about this, but it's so true. You know, another f- famous ambivert, I think, is Abraham Lincoln. Uh, well, he was he was supposed to have like told dirty jokes. He was yeah, he, he, he laughed all the time late yeah. at night t- telling stories. But he could be as loving his solitude as the yeah. biggest introvert in the world. Exactly. You know, I think Stephen Colbert is probably an ambivert. I think Oprah Winfrey would probably register as an ambivert. Yeah. I think I think there's a lot of people. Uh, so yeah, it's fascinating to me. Well, I think what 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 the book really kind of brought home to me is this kind of balancing act between authority or externalization of things or directiveness versus you know uh, presence, uh, quietness, being able to sit with things and just be. And I think that uh, our society doesn't pay attention to that and it, it's it's a subtle mixture all of us need variations of, of of that to certain degrees and things change in our life there might be periods where you're more social or you're more um out there outgoing more directive so to speak and i think that that balance between those two things is i think that might be the thread that's going to lead to your next book perhaps yeah. i think so too i think it's actually funny because it, therapeutic presence really maps more to the introverted side of us and therapeutic authority really maps to the extroverted side. And we're all built with both of those things. We have deeply formed inner worlds and we're extraordinary social creatures. Exactly. And it's always a balancing act. And I think that's how we really engage the fullness of our humanity. I, I think we've lost the, I think we've lost the, uh, sense of, of beauty and uh, integrity and reality of our inner worlds by being yeah. more outwardly oriented in uh, a kind of scientific method, Western scientific method. Nothing behind the black box is real. But uh, perhaps we're entering a period of time where that's going to be attuned to more. Uh, more I of think, a, you know, as you yeah. see, we, we have the corrective of mindfulness coming back. Yeah. You know, as, as an actually part of the mainstream. And I think even like, look at um, Susan Cain, for example, with not only her, how successful her book on introverts was, but now she has this book on this bittersweet and, and bringing in these, these kind of seemingly contradictory aspects of being human and relishing in them and celebrating them and, and not necessarily having to separate them. Yeah. Well, I, I'm a huge proponent of clinical hypnosis, but I think that you can learn hypnosis to do a lot of the same things or more than what mindfulness can do for you. Um, it, it, they're, it's just a term. It's a, they, they, they're both basic, basically kind of the same thing. But the literature is vast and there's ways for us to help people with that technique um, and extend the presence or use of mindfulness to help people. Um before we go, do you have any workshops coming up? You must you must be getting requests for workshops. Are I will I may or may not be at APA this year, uh, cool. but are you going to be at APA? Has anybody in, in Division Thirty Two or any of the other divisions said come and and put on a workshop here, or have you thought about a CE? Yeah, I'm looking I'm looking forward to getting stuff out there. I'm going to yeah. be doing a, a special book launch event uh, on May 17th with Nancy Williams is going to be interviewing me, which is going awesome. to be exciting. And I'm going to be working a lot with Psychotherapy Networker, um, awesome. putting stuff out there for them. Uh, there's going to be like a 30 minute kind of preview and then a one hour webinar. And I, I love the Networker because it's it's such a great community of of creative therapists. And so you'll 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 probably be seeing me getting out there quite a bit. And I'm I'm certainly open and excited to do more and more workshops and 
I, I love connecting with people from different areas within psychology and social work and, and therapy and coaching and everything. Cool. So. Well, everybody, the book is, goodness, what is the book? I'm so engrossed in, I'm so engrossed in the book. I forgot your title. <laughs> it's a therapeutic it's improvisation. Yeah. <laughs> How to stop winging it and own it as a therapist. It's available from Norton. Uh, I guess it's, it's probably in brick and mortar stores and online everywhere as we speak. Check it out. It's really worth uh, giving a good dive into it. Thank you so much for being on the show, Michael. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Okay. Same here. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Psychology Talk podcast. Did you know you can find us on the web all over the place? Well, maybe not all over the place, but you can find us on Instagram, you can find us on Facebook, you can find us at Spreaker, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, loads of places. Please look for us, and if you can, subscribe, like us, leave us a review, send us a comment, a criticism. Hey, we like to hear a lot from people. Go ahead, talk to us, that's why we're here. By the way, this is just a reminder to let you know that all the material here is for entertainment and informative purposes only. If you do need a therapist or a mental health professional, please seek one out. Music is provided by the band Serenati.